here that you feel that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. Eğlan tüm halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı. Ne fazla ne az. And of feelings that that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. A lot of killers. Why well, you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello and welcome to Barn Blog. And today I'm here with Dr. Victor Divanets, um, who is distinguished professor of management at uh, uh, Illinois State um, University, and is a specialist in U.S. labor history, particularly um, labor relations. Um, uh, I think you've done specific work on uh, the history of labor in the South, and uh, you've done uh other work on how to revive the labor movement correct yes i have yeah so some of my work is in uh 20th century u.s labor history i'm interested in how political <clears throat> radicalism intersects with the trade union movement i also have written articles on union organizing and also cover current labor events so those are uh the research topics that i write <laughs> on so I was introduced to your research and uh, through uh, an interview you did on Cosmo, uh, for Cosmonaut Magazine on the TUL, and then I went and looked some of your articles up. Yes. Um, uh, because the TULs, for me, uh, is, not a, is not an organization that I hear talked about at all. Um, yes. And, I, and uh, while I'm not a labor historian, I am... Yes. I am actually a union rep, and yeah. uh, and I thought I knew a lot of this stuff. And yeah. when I looked at your research, I realized right. that um, outside of knowing a little bit about the actions in Alabama because of mainly the work in Hammer and Ho, I think is really popular. Okay. Is that yeah. um, uh, U.S. labor, the U.S. labor movement during the during um the third period so the late 1920s or the 1930s right. was not something i knew that much about so right. you know i knew about the heroic period R right uh, of the iww <laughs> i know about the heroic period of the cio yeah. and then there's a gap <laughs> yes and i think and i think the reason is you know there hasn't been much written about third period uh the time of third period communism as you said basically from 1929 to 1934 because um, in terms of the comparison of the success to the CIO, which came a few years later during the Popular Front, there really wasn't much success. And also in terms of the third period communism, you know, the Communist Party also adopted some policies of calling opponents uh, socialists, Trotskyists, other leftists social fascists and the reformist AFL union social fascists. So it's it, and. So there really hasn't been much, you're right, there really hasn't been much written about the TUUL during that time period. So um, the TUUL kind of comes out of the TUEL. Can you talk about what they are and what the differences are for my audience yeah. who probably doesn't know about them? Yeah, that that's an excellent question. Yeah, so the Trade Union Educational League was the first uh, Communist Party arm in the U.S. trade union movement. And... So that uh, basically became a Communist Party arm in the early 1920s. And the purpose of the TUEL, the Trade Union Educational League, was boring from within the American Federation of Labor Unions. So basically, uh, you know, Communist Party members, Communist Party supporters, which have often been called in the literature fellow travelers, um, would uh, in these AFL unions form uh, trade union educational leagues basically to promote their policies and try to win the craft unionists over to their positions, which were basically for industrial unions amalgamating the craft unions and organizing the unskilled and semi-skilled workers and also promoting a labor party for the American working class because the American Federation of Labor was pretty much devoted to uh, pure and simple unionism, a current 
you know, current uh, at the time, uh, uh, a craft, a conservative craft unionism. So the trade union educational league was trying to bore within those AFL unions to try to win the conservative craft unionists over to their policies. So how was uh, the, the T-U-E-L bore within a strategy different from the I-W-W bore within a strategy? Well, like... so, I mean, so the I-W-W uh, set up, basically, we would consider that to be a dual union. Mm-hmm. And they were organizing industrial unions in opposition to the AFL unions at the time, which were in existence. So they were organizing everybody, unskilled workers, semi-skilled workers, right? Skilled workers, anyone who worked with their hand or their brain, the IWW wanted to organize, and they also wanted to organize groups that the AFL unions wouldn't organize, immigrant workers, women workers, black workers, etc. So the AFL unions only organizing, right, the skilled workers in the craft unions were only organizing the white native-born English-speaking males. So it was really a different kind of strategy there. Um, and so the the shift from the T U E L to the T U U L really seems to be prompted by both third periodism and the Great Depression. But what? Yeah. How does that shift happen? Like you know? Yeah. So I mean, um, in terms of the T U E L, you know, their success really varied in terms of the different unions that they were involved in. In, in some unions, they they really didn't even get a toehold, and in some unions, they almost took power, like the. Uh, International Lady Garment Workers Union in New York City, right, that they almost took power. So in terms of where, uh, like in the ILGWU, where they almost took power, they were basically expelled. And so even before the uh, the Trade Union Unity League was formed, in 1929, uh, you know, the year before 1928, they formed the Needle Trades Workers Industrial Union, basically to promote their policies. And because they did have a base of support in the Needle Trades Workers in in New York City, also in other major urban areas like you know Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, etc. So, and even before the TUUL was formed formally in 1929, there were uh, you know, the, the Communist Party had set up a number of industrial unions, also the National Textile Workers Union, the National Miners Union, um, and the Auto Workers Union, which originated out of the Knights of Labor, but the Communist Party was leading by the end of, of the 1920s. So basically, you're right in terms of kind of the common turn, the third period communism, they believe that you know, a revolutionary period was coming, capitalism was going to collapse so that the communists had to pull out and develop these revolutionary unions. So, but already, I mean, even before that, because uh, in terms of communist party members being active in unions, they were already moving towards uh, forming these industrial unions on their own, but certainly the common turns diktats uh, led them to, you know, to organize the, the Trade Union Unity, Unity League in August 1929. So one of the things your work indicated to me is there were communists all over the place during this time period, except maybe, I mean, they were even kind of organizing with the AFL. Uh, they were yes. even organizing in uh, the the company unions and i'm gonna yes I, we should define what that is because we yes. don't mean business unions here we mean right, something right, even correct. more specific um right. yeah. so uh but how did the politics of the third period did do you feel like it helped or hampered uh their efforts i, I do think for example um in the south it yes. seemed like it may have actually helped because that there's no you know you didn't have to try to appeal to segregationist Democrats with these things. Right. Uh, um, yeah. So, I mean, certainly, you know, in the South and, you know, you talked about Hammer and Ho, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Kelly's book, right, which is certainly an excellent book. I don't know if you're 
familiar with the more recent book on the history of the Alabama Communist Party, Red, White, and Black, Mary Stanton's book in 2019, which studies the Alabama Communist Party from 1930 to 1950. I mean, in terms, and it talks about the organized, and it was really done under conditions of terror there, mm -hmm. you know, in, and in terms of things like the sharecroppers union, for instance, you know, uh, you know, which was really, uh, you know, organizing, you know, black workers. There were a few minor victories, a lot of losses, but they were really under the periods of, of terror. But even in terms of, you know, when they moved from third period communism to the popular front and, you know, the popular front called for uniting with everybody to oppose fascism, you know, that would include, uh, you know, liberal Democrats, liberal Democrats with a big D, you know, the, the Democratic Party. But uh, you're right, in terms of the South, the Dixiecrats, which were the ones that enforced Jim Crow, there was no kind of alliance with that. So, you know, the Communist Party still, in terms of organizing, trying to organize there, still faced a lot of terror at the time, which, which is really outlined in, in Stanton's book. I have not read Stanton's book, and I, I should now. Um, yeah. One of the things that, that really interests me about this, because the CIO is so successful later on, but it's not successful in the South. Like, the, yeah. uh, you know, after 1936, things seem to actually get worse. And I, I'm actually from Georgia, and okay. public sector unions yeah. are still illegal. Yeah. Um, right. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, 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 I think it's crucial to American history to like kind of understand that, but I, I do find it, I do find it interesting because, you know, both the, the, the AFL and, and to some degree, even the SPA uh, had mm -hmm. forgone any, you know, had forgone a lot of unskilled labor and yeah. a particularly, particularly uh, minority labor. Yeah. Um, uh, so, the the TUL uh, hit direct opposition with them at any point in the 30s. Um, hit, hit opposition with who are you talking about? Uh, with the AFL or with the SPA? Yeah, in terms of certainly, in t you know, they viewed you know both of these groups as, as social fascists. So there was there was conflict certainly in terms of those groups. Now you know, going back, you know, to talk about the South in terms of the TUUL organizing and then the Communist Party organizing in terms of the CIO, you know, they, you know, at both times, uh, you know, they had harsh treatment from the Dixiecrats. And uh, as you know, in terms of the National Labor Relations Act, which was passed in 1935, which gave the vast majority of private sector workers the legal right at the federal level, right, to unionize and to collectively bargain in order to get the National Labor Relations Act passed in Congress. Roosevelt did need the Dixiecrat support, though. So in a sense, Roosevelt made a deal with the devil that they were willing to support the National Labor Relations Act as long as the, the National Labor Relations Act did not cover agricultural labor and domestic labor, which is what the majority of black workers were in at the time, because they felt if black workers were able to organize unions, then then that this would threaten to overthrow the Jim Crow regime. Right. So, yeah, th I, th that's what I had understood. So that that is. Yeah. The, did that complicate any of the uh, organizing in the West of like um, Chicano or, uh, or um, immigrant labor? Well, certainly in terms of, you know, the TUL was active in organizing, for instance, out in California was organizing, you know, had an agricultural workers union and was active in organizing there. And they were organizing, uh, you know, that was a multiracial workforce and they were active in organizing them. And actually they had some success in terms of um, out West in terms of the agricultural uh, agricultural workers, but, you know, uh, the, the AFL unions would not organize agricultural workers. So, you know, they did not come into any conflict with the, with the AFL mm -hmm. unions over that. You know? Um, so the, the, the TUL was really kind of crucial. 
with um i guess with the iww as well but in battling social uh social chauvinism and and in craft unionism and in some ways i think it, it's being forgotten is really sad because it, it as your work illustrates it produces a lot of the leaders of the cio yes um uh one of the things that's interesting me uh, interesting me about this was this united front from below strategy yes. as opposed to the boring within strategy which both the iww right. kind of done and and the uh the T U E L had attempted. Right. Um, what is the United Front from Below strategy, and why was it important? Okay, so the United Front from Below strategy that the T U U L used was to try to unite with workers in AFL unions to try to win them over to their positions to have some various kinds of actions where they could join forces. What, but it wasn't in terms of uniting with the leaders of the AFL unions, but it was uh, with the workers themselves that they were trying to, to, to do this kind of organizing. And I mean, also a strategy though, right? The Communist Party did set up these independent uh, industrial unions, independent of the AFL. But even during third period communism, one of their strategies still was to develop fractions within the AFL unions to try to win people over to the TUUL's position. So they were in probably in terms of where they were most successful in, in doing this kind of work within the AFL unions, developing uh, fractions was uh, during the third period communism was in the needle trades unions and also the building trades unions, but it certainly mm -hmm. varied on a union by union basis, how successful they were. So, so they did not abandon the AFL unions at the time. So, and I mean, it was really a three pronged strategy that they were using because they were also attempting to try to lead and organize and direct independent unions, right? That had no affiliation with the American Federation of Labor, with the TUUL, with the IWW, and basically trying to lead various strikes, lead the unions, and eventually their goal was to try to win them over to the Trade Union Unity League. One thing your work points to that I didn't know much about, this is another part of uh, labor history that I've, I've seen ever covered, is the period before, you know, uh, the, the Labor Relations Act, the Wagner Act, yep. um, but after the first round of reforms pushed by Roosevelt, which yes. created the space for unions. But one of the yes. things that you talk about are company unions. Yes. Can you go into that and sure. how the TUL interacted with them? <laughs> So in terms of with company unions, yeah, that's an excellent question. So what company and 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 you made, a, I think, an excellent comment earlier, distinguishing company unionism from business unionism, right? Company union, what company union is, uh, unionism is, which are also called work councils, employee representation plans. They're basically labor organizations that are set up by companies. So they're an arm of the company. Right. So, for instance, in terms of setting up, they might give them the office space on site. Uh, they might select the officers. They might actually fund them. And so they look like labor organizations, but they really don't have any kind of collective bargaining power because they're not independent of the company. Now, I mean, uh, you know, there were. Uh, there were some positive things company unions did. For instance, they provided voice to, uh, for workers. If workers had complaints, they were a mechanism to uh, have employers hear the complaints, but they weren't, they weren't uh, independent labor organizations. And so companies set them up in order to try to prevent independent unions from forming. And, and the point you said earlier, uh, which is a good point that uh, the National Industrial Recovery Act, which was passed in 1933, which was the first piece of la uh, labor legislation, which provided some of the same protections of the National Labor Relations Act, but was declared unconstitutional in 1934 because of the codes, uh, 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 because of uh, labor standards that were to be set up by uh, by by companies and unions and and the state 
that was declared unconstitutional. Um, so in terms of the interaction, uh, oh, and so during that time, you know, after the National Industrial Recovery Act was passed, a lot of companies organized company unions in order to try to prevent independent unions from forming. Okay. Uh, and so the, the National Labor Relations Act did make company unions illegal when it was passed in 1935. But from 1933 to 1935, uh, a lot of companies organized these company unions to, to keep out independent labor organizations. And just in terms of some figures, right? So by 1935, there were 2.8 million workers in AFL unions, but there were 2.5 million in company unions, right? So there and and you know comparing that to the trade union unity league at its peak after the passage of the national industrial recovery act was about 125,000 or so. So there were a significant number of employees in company unions. Now, to go back to talk about the relationship between the TUUL and company unions in terms of my uh, examining of the archive, uh, you know, archival data and secondary data, there isn't really much um, written in terms of the TUUL interacting with company unions. But what there is, what I have found is that there were, where there were commun uh, where there were company unions, Communist Party members were active in them, such as in General Electric, which helped then to lead when the CIO was formed to the formation of the United Electrical Workers Union. They were active in International Harvester in the company union, which then led during the CIO period to the Farm Equipment Workers Union. And both the Farm Equipment Workers Union and the United Electrical Workers Union were, com were, were Communist Party-led unions. So there were communists that were involved in terms of, of company unions and trying to push company unions to their demo, to the democratic limits that that they could so. one of the key figures of the TUL is interesting to me and I wonder if he's indicative of uh, the relationship between the IWW and the TUUL um, so William Z Foster uh, yes. starts off in the IWW and as an S yes. uh, SPA member um, yes. I don't remember when he switches affiliation to the CPUSA, but it's he's pretty early. It's pretty, yeah, it's about 1920 or so. Oh, and okay. I mean, you know, you know, he's identified because of his organizing skills, as he pointed out, in terms of the IWW, and also, you know, he played a major role in organizing the 1919 steelworkers strike which was largely unsuccessful, but he's viewed as a very important organizer and the Communist Party targets him in terms of trying to win him over. So, so um, what I find interesting about that is he is both a super loyal Moscow man, but yes. also still kind of a syndicalist? Yes. How does that work? <laughs> yeah, so he, you know, he really... Uh, he really is a syndicalist, I mean, mm -hmm. in terms of and uh, where I got my master's degree from University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And I wrote my master's uh, uh, project on the labor philosophy of William Z. Foster. So you're right. He is very loyal in terms of Moscow. But at heart, he really is a syndicalist in terms of, though, you know, he he is key in terms of you know, the strategies that he's outlined and the things that he wrote were, were really important in terms of organizing the CIO unions. And, you know, of course, the Communist Party was was very active in organizing the CIO union. So he is an important figure and he is a loyal party man. Right. And he is a Stalinist, one of the hardcore Stalinists. But at, at heart, he is a syndicalist. Um. So it's 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 also interesting that like he had alliances with people who would be would be kicked out later. Like he apparently had an alliance with James with James Cannon at one point. Yes, he did. Yeah, wild. <laughs> yeah, the the Cannon Foster faction exactly. And you're right. You know, Cannon Cannon was expelled in terms of 1928. In terms of after coming back from the uh, from the the, the sixth uh, common turn Congress, and you know he sides with Trotsky and smuggle some documents back. So he's expelled as a Trotskyist with a few other people and starts actively organizing the Trotskyist organization. Exactly. So, 
So uh, during during the twenties, is the TU well? Are sec- are sectarian divisions really hampering it? Because I mean, at this point, the Trotskyists are kicked out. Yeah. Um, it's the, their relationship to the IWW seems ambivalent, if not outright hostile. Yes. Um. Uh. The CAO isn't formed yet. There's right. So, um, yeah. it like um yet. Yeah, how does the uh, popular front from below kind of operate within this increasingly sectarian yeah. environment? Okay, that's a good question. Yeah. So in terms of the United Front from below, um, in terms of, you're right, so, you know, there were the Trotskyists that were expelled in 1928, right? They still consider themselves to be an external faction of the Communist Party until basically Hitler takes power, then they basically claim the Communist Party can't be reformed. We have to set up our own uh, international, right? The Fourth International. Now, also, too, as I'm sure you know, in 1929, Jay Lovestone is expelled Mm. from the Communist Party, and uh, the Lovestoneites are expelled, and they set up an organization, right? They're really followers of Bukharin. And so, but, uh, you know, even at this time, and, you know, in the early years, they're, you know, uh, talking about like, you know, 1929 to, you know, 1932, 1933, there's only maybe a few hundred, uh, you know, a couple hundred Trotskyists around and they're trying to get stability in their organization and they're not really active in terms of mass actions. But in some places, for instance, they are still involved in terms of the needle trade workers, industrial union, and the Lovestoneites as well. Uh, Charles Zimmerman uh, was for a while a leader in the needle trades workers, industrial union, and and he was a a Lovestoneite. So, you know, even though the, you know, the Trotskyists and, and the Lovestoneites, you know, have serious criticisms of the Communist Party. Uh, at times, they're they're active in the TUUL unions, but but not that much, you know. But uh, one thing I noticed, and I don't have a a good re- a good theory for this, is uh, textile work seems to be where communists are particularly successful. Um, is is there a reason for that? So that you have the Lady Garment Workers Union, you yeah. have the Needle Trade Union, yeah. Um, why do communists seem to be particularly successful in that industry? Yeah, that that's a good question. I mean, the in terms of you know, and this goes back to the you know International Lady Garment Workers Union, the ILGWU, which which was formed in in 1900, but very on, early on had a strong socialist leadership there, so they really had a base of support there. But um, and in terms of the needle trade workers industrial union is really in terms of light manufacturing, their shops are smaller, right, compared to things like, you know, steel mills, auto, auto plants, rubber plants, et cetera. So they were able to, to get a base of support in light manufacturing and not only in terms of like the needle trades, but in terms of. Uh, you know, the Needle Trade Workers Industrial Union also organized like, you know, other light manufacturing um, in terms of pocketbook workers, you know, purses, you know, there was, uh, you know, there was uh, a TUUL union of shoe workers in which um, uh, they were quite strong. So I think that these were because these were basically smaller shops that the TUUL often had more power and in the in some of the larger factories plants in in the major industries they couldn't get the same kind of level of support Hmm. um how did the tul respond to the minneapolis general strike and the formation of the teamsters um yeah so i mean in terms of uh you know and so this was just kind of at the time when when the strike so the minneapolis teamster strike occurred right in 1934 and that was one of the three major uh you know afl strikes that occurred at the time there was you know the uh, the toledo auto light strike Mm -hmm. that was led by the mustyites the minneapolis teamster strike by the trotskyists and then the San Francisco Longshoremen strike by the communists. So um, 
this was in 1934. So already this was kind of the start of the transition period to the popular front. So, you know, the TUUL was starting to wind down at that time. And mm. certainly, depending on the unions, different unions were shut down in 1934, some in 1935. And they were told, basically, uh, you know, in terms of at, at the seventh common turn Congress, right, with the formation of the Popular Front to get back into the AFL unions. And this was kind of an important time to do this because, you know, there was significant radicalism going on in that these three, uh, you know, AFL strikes were quite successful and they were led by political radicals. So, you know, the Communist Party is getting back into the AFL unions just about six months before the CIO was formed, which was formed at the 1935 AFL convention over the debate on whether we should, you know, after the passage of the Wagner Act, the National Labor Relations Act, whether we should attempt to organize industrial unions or not. And, uh, you know, there was a vigorous debate going on on, on the conference floor there and big bill hutchison right the carpenters union president was basically arguing you know industrial union uh we can't successfully organize industrial unions because unskilled and semi-skilled workers don't have trade union consciousness you know john lewis right the mine workers president basically got fed up with what he was saying punched him and basically knocked him down. And he was a big guy. He was 6'4", 350 pounds. And that's when John L. Lewis marched out. You know, the mine workers marched out and eight other unions marched out and they formed the Committee of Industrial Organization. They first viewed themselves as a wing of the AFL and they just wanted to organize uh, unskilled, semi-skilled, skilled workers in industrial unions, but still be part of the AFL. So it wasn't until two years later in 1938, a little over two years later, that the Congress of Industrial Organizations was formed. And so, you know, the, uh, so, um, you know, when they, uh, when they marched out, you know, the Communist Party marched out with the CIO unions and they became active organizers, for instance, and became leaders of some of the major uh, CIO unions like the United Electrical Workers Union, the Farm Equipment uh, Union. Uh, they were a major organizer in the Steel Workers Organizing Committee, which became the United Steel Workers. So, so at the time when, uh, you know, the Minneapolis Teamster strike was going on, the TUU TUUL was in the process of moving back into the AFL unions. So it is interesting that that uh, that the synthesis of the communist plus a, a figure like uh, John John Lewis is what leads this to the CIO. Because yep. uh, I mean, people who don't know this, John Lewis is a Republican. He's an yes. isolationist. He yes, he's if he is opposition to fascism at best. Yep. Um, <laughs> um, but. Uh, it does seem like a lot of the best CIO organizers come out of not just the communists, but the, the TUUL in specific. Is that yeah. true? Or... Yeah, well, I think a lot of these uh, uh, organizers, Communist Party organizers, really got their start in terms of the TUUL unions. And remember, now that we're organizing industrial unions, we're not just organizing the the white native born english speaking males right because they're mm -hmm. the ones who are more likely to be the skilled workers so the afl unions were only organizing a fraction of the working class but the majority of the working class are unskilled and semi-skilled workers and these are the workers who are immigrants these are the workers who are women these are the the black workers right so these are the workers that the Communist Party was organizing in the TUUL unions out in California, right? They're organizing, uh, you know, as you pointed out, uh, you know, Chicano workers and Filipino workers, multiracial workers. And but if you head into the uh, the mass production plants among the unskilled and semi-skilled workers, these are the workers you're going to confront. So the Communist Party organizers really got their practice in organizing the TUUL unions and and use their skills to good stead when organizing the the CIO unions. So um 
were any of the communist party leaders of color i mean there a lot of people talk about like the the black belt thesis and all that but yes. um i think your work actually points out that that wasn't particularly that didn't actually that wasn't actually particularly successful outside of the leadership as a yes. organizing strategy so how did they organize amongst um black workers Yes, the, uh, excellent question. In terms of, I think the main thing in terms of black workers that they were promoting was interracial unionism. And mm. that was a way to attract black workers. So it wasn't to try to segregate black workers into their own union, but interracial unionism. And that really attracted the black workers. Now, uh, you know, for instance, in the South, as you talked about before, that was really hard to try to win a lot of white workers over to that position. But that's how they won black workers over to, to form these interracial unions. And of course, you know, that's what threatened the Dixiecrats was, especially if you had these interracial unions. And I'm I'm sure you're aware of, of what right to work laws are <laughs> and that, you yeah. know, it was... Uh, you know, the Confederacy that, you know, were the first states to pass the right to work laws. And one of the reasons behind that, the Dixiecrats want, you know, didn't want to have interracial unions because they viewed that this would then uh, be a good chance to overthrow the Jim Crow regime so that they wanted to try to keep black and white workers divided. So from very early on, the Communist Party was promoting interracial unionism, which attracted black workers to it. Oh, I think this is uh, something to understand is it, this was a, you had to convince black workers of this as well, because the uh, AFL unions have been so historically hostile to them. Correct. And I mean, it seems obvious in hindsight, but it was a it also seems like it was a very easy means of control because you, you, I mean, I think that the most famous example of this being uh, Carnegie, Carnegie bringing in black workers to break up mine strikes. Yes. And, but that strategy was just consistent. Like, it, yes. it, it, you know. Um, yes. And that's, that's an excellent mm -hmm. point. Let me just add on to that mm -hmm. point. And, and, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's why, you know, the, uh, you know, the AFL unions were saying, oh, we can't organize black workers because they always act as strike breakers, right? They always, when white workers go out on strike, they steal their jobs, right? They lack trade union consciousness. That's why we can't organize them. But, but why, why did black workers act as replacement workers or strike breakers? Because oftentimes that's the only time they could get a job or a halfway decent job. So I'm not, you know, saying that that's fine that they were strike breakers, but you have to understand that. So you're right. And so that, you know, in terms of uh, black workers didn't have a very positive view of unionism because of their experience with the AFL. So even to win them over to industrial unions, you know, you know, took a while to see that uh, that that the CIO unions were were really interested in the Communist Party was really interested in forming interracial unions. How long did it take to build that trust there? Like, um... yeah, so it it it, it certainly I, I'd say that um, you know we see uh, some some uh, movement, uh, some real change probably by the late 1930s. But you know the the CIO unions are starting to organize in in 1936, and even if you look at the auto companies, right? Ford was the last one that was organized in terms of 1941, right? General Motors, uh, you know, was organized earlier and, and the Flint sit-down strike uh, of about seven weeks from December 28th, 1936 to February 11th, 1937, basically forced uh, the, the UAW to rec or forced General Motors to recognize the UAW as the exclusive collective bargaining agent for six months. So you know, early on, you know, black workers were skeptical, but I think, you know, after a few years in terms of organizing, they began to be won over. So, so the success really kind of comes after the TUL period though. Like it begins there and kind of really picks up in the SAO period. 
Yes, definitely. And I think, well, you know, what you said earlier on is correct. You know, you talked about, you know, the CIO being, uh, you know, an heroic period in terms of where organizing is occurring. And it's occurring among immigrants, black and women workers, uh, a lot of people that, you know, denied union membership before. And also, as you stated before, right, the IWW, uh, because they were, you know, aggressively organizing immigrant workers and women workers, et cetera, in terms of industrial unionism, that that was a heroic period, too. So um, I guess I have actually always wondered this. Where was the IWW in the, in the early 1930s? Because it seems to be a lull in their history. That... There, there is certainly a lull in the history. I mean, probably after, you know, uh, you know the heyday, really of the IWW was from its founding in 1905 to 1920. And mm -hmm. certainly, you know, the re the first Red Scare after World War I, which targeted radical immigrants. Um, and, and the IWW was also targeted during World War I because they opposed World War I, unlike the AFL unions, which supported World War I. So by the early 1920s, you're right, the IWW is still around, but in terms of the influence it has, it's not as important. Now, there is a revival a bit in terms of, you know, the Great Depression years of the 1930s in terms of the early 1930s. The IWW is reviving a bit and it still has the same, you know, revolutionary syndicalist tactics that it had in terms of its formation. But um, it's not experiencing the same level of success that it had earlier. Okay, um, are the T are the TUL unions in direct competition with the IWW? Or are they just kind of operating completely separately? Like, yeah, I'd say there? they're not. I, I I would say that they're not really in competition okay. at the time in terms of that. And you know, one thing in terms of you know, besides uh, you know the IWW syndicalism, you know, another difference, even though they're both uh, industrial unions, both organizing immigrant workers, women workers, black workers, etc. Um, the IWW uh, didn't like to sign collective bargaining agreements because mm. it thought that it would tie the hands of what workers could do on the shop floor in terms of militant action, where even though the Trade Union Unity League really had uh, you know, an inclusive participatory shop floor unionism, they realized the importance of collective bargaining agreements in terms of consolidating gains so that they were quite willing to sign collective bargaining agreements. And I think, you know, the IWW expected their membership to always be ready to participate in militant actions at a moment's notice. And that's hard to do to kind of keep people you know, continually motivated to do that. You need periods of time where you consolidate your gains. And then when other problems come up, you can get people involved, which is kind of, uh, you know, the strategy that, you know, the Communist Party led unions also used in terms of the, of the CIO, in terms of their shop for unionism. So we mentioned Foster being, um, uh, you know, a pretty avid Stalinist, even if he was also a syndicalist. But it's hard to parse out to me during this tier, during this time period, even how much the CPUSA was actually really on a day to day basis taking orders from Moscow. Yeah. Um, uh, most of the research I've seen recently indicates that it kind of wasn't beyond the very top leadership and how much of how much they affected the rank and file is actually questionable. What about the TUUL? Were they like, you know, I, I think one of the reasons why they're undercovered is people just assume that they were like kind of a robotic arm of Soviet foreign policy. And that doesn't seem to be true. But... Yeah. Uh, in terms of, right, the TUUL, you know, they did have have slogans that they were supposed to promote things mm -hmm. like class against class, defend mm -hmm. the Soviet Union for a Soviet America. But they were often criticized by the leadership because in in their organizing and their everyday struggles and the strikes that they lead, they weren't raising the slogans, right? So that they were doing the things that other unions were trying to do, but on an industrial union basis, trying to get the best wages, working conditions, uh, shop floor recognition for the workers that the AFL unions were doing. So the leadership, uh, you know, often kind of complained that 
that they weren't raising these these slogans during their their daily work in the TUUL units. How meaningful would those slogans have been in that time period? Like I, I often yeah. don't know what knowledge of the Soviet Union and Soviet right. policy would have even been in the early 1930s. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that they would have been uh, if if they raised those slogans that that would have been a way to get more workers to join them. I think what what's important in terms of getting workers to join them is in terms of providing sufficient representation for them and to get them active. And the you know the T UL tried to build leadership amongst young workers, among women workers, among black workers, and tried to get them active in terms of, of the union, where the AFL unions were really unions that were guided by the union officials and, you know, you know, uh, guided by, you know, as you stated before, by, you know, business unionism and pure and simple unionism. And they weren't interested in having an inclusive participatory shop floor unionism. They were interested in an exclusive, you know, non-participatory business unionism or pure and simple unionism. And, you know, they just, in a sense, wanted the members, the AFL unions, wanted the members to participate. If they did call a strike, of course, to take part in a strike, but it's not that they wanted their members to be active in running the day-to-day -day affairs of the AFL unions. They wanted that left to the union officialdom. So the TUUL unions were actually more participatory and democratic in their actual running then? Well, well, I mean, uh, they strove for that. Okay. You know, that was a goal. And th they weren't always successful in terms of that. But that's something that they strove for. And there was a lot of criticism, you know, in internally in terms of when they weren't as democratic or participatory as they should have been. There was a lot of self-criticism about that. So that's what they strove for. So it's not that, you know, all of the TUUL unions were successful and were perfect democratic participatory shop floor oriented unions, but that's what they were striving for. Um, well, I think one thing that I th for people who are in unions now, I would say while there are still unions that are motivated by industrial union models, um, it does seem like after the 1950s, the AFL uh, style bureaucracy wins out. Um, yes. How much is the purging of the communists that are, you know, from this period and later related to that? Yes, excellent question. I think that is really important, right? Because, you know, the expulsion of the Communist Party led unions from the CIO in 1949, 1950, that was the militant wing of the CIO. I mean, there were other leftists who were, you know, who were active as well, but the Communist Party was the largest group in terms of that. And except for, you know, during the World War II period where the Communist Party supported the no strike pledge because of our alliance with the Soviet Union, you know, for for most of it of its existence, except during World War II, it was the the more militant wing and and more interested in terms of shop floor oriented unionism. So once they're expelled, right? I mean, the, you know, the, the CIO unions are much more bureaucratic. They're looking a lot more like the AFL unions, right? Even though, right, they have organized, right, unskilled, semi-skilled workers. They have immigrants, black workers, you know, women workers in it. But, you know, uh, in terms of philosophy, they look much more like the AFL unions. And so, you know, that's what also contributes to... The merger of the American Federation of Labor and the Congress of Industrial Organizations in 1955, right? And I mean, there was certainly talk at the time, actually, after the Communist Party led unions were expelled, um, about them forming a third labor federation or organization, a progressive labor federation or organization. But the Communist Party leadership wanted, and remember, this is also at the time of, right, the second red scare of McCarthyism, mm -hmm. et cetera. And so the, you know, the Communist Party basically wants the expelled unions to try to get back into the AFL unions, to try to get back into the mainstream of the U.S. trade union movement. But, you know, this is a time period where the Communist Party is really on the defensive, right? The Foley Square trials in, in 1949, right? And, 
and you know uh you know party leaders secondary leaders you know going underground in the early 1950s because they thought that this could be a period of incipient fascism coming to the united states so you know the communist party is really on the defense of it at at that time you know hmm. um yeah one thing i've always wondered it and maybe this isn't known but um you know uh how much party membership uh, compliance? Well, compliance maybe is the wrong way to phrase it. But how how what percentage of a lot of the, of the TUL unions of the later communist led CIO unions were actually party members? Oh yeah, that's an excellent question. I mean, actually, in terms of really a fairly small part, mm -hmm. and that you know the uh, you know the party members were active in the TUUL unions and the Communist Party fractions, and oftentimes the fractions were were very small, were fairly small. So the vast majority of members in the trade union unity league unions were non-party members. Right? Mm. So. Um... Did did the lack of member did the lack of membership and maybe understanding what what the the CPUSA was doing um, did that ever hamper their organizational ep uh, efforts? Did it help? Like, did it have no effect at all? <laughs> well, I mean, I think you know, uh, in terms of the time when we're talking about the TUUL unions, in in terms of kind of the latter part, maybe in 1933 or so, 1933, 1934, you know, there were probably 18,000 Communist Party members. So the organization was not really that large, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, the organization really started taking off in terms of membership an increase in membership and then also an increase in influence in terms of other organizations, not just trade unions during the popular front period, right? So, you know, by the late 1930s, uh, you know, party membership was probably somewhere around 75,000 or so. So, you know, within a period of about six years or so, it had more than quadrupled in terms of members, so. Hmm. Um, I've also wondered how, when, uh, how many of these, uh, labor organizers had like, like, uh, Forrest had started, um, with the SPA and left when the communist party was formed. Um, was it a very, very small faction? Was there a lot of people with the long history like that? Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, so good question. So, I mean, certainly, you know, some of the organizers, right, were in the Socialist Party of America and left in terms of 1919, in terms of where there was a split, right? And, you know, two communist parties were formed at the time, right? The, the, the Communist Labor Party and the Communist Party of America, which later on that they merged. But also in terms of, of some of these organizers came from the IWW <laughs> that had been syndicalists. And after the Russian Revolution, right, and after they saw the Russian Revolution, had been won over to the idea of the importance of a political party in guiding the working class, right? And so then there were also, you know, some people who, who were fairly young during the Socialist Party of America and were young adults in terms of the 1920s who were recruited to the Communist Party who became organizers at the time too. So, um, so in terms of these Communist Party union organizers, some of them certainly had roots in, uh, you know, the Socialist Party of America, but also in terms of the IWW as well. So this is just occurring to me, and this is way after the period we're talking about, but um, it does seem to me that, like, uh, I've always kind of thought the unstated premise of Taft-Hartley is to stop the formation of a labor party in the United States. Like, that's... You know, I don't know that the people thought about that, but that seems to be the results of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the strategies that led to the formation of the of the SP Day, et cetera, just weren't possible legally mm -hmm. um, in the United States after that point. Um, do you think that's why, even during say the the late sixties, early seventies, when you had a huge, I mean, uh, the if it was divided up amongst many many sects, admittedly, Sorry. but uh, a huge uh, radical left movement in the United States um, compared to what it was in the 50s and even the 40s. Um, there was not any success 
you know, trying to recapitulate these strategies yeah. uh, in the seventies. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think, I think you're getting at a good point. And I think the point, the important point is, and, you know, as you pointed out, right, in a sense, the old left, right, the Socialist Party of America, right, the Communist Party USA, right, the Trotskyists, the Socialist Workers Party, with the Red Scare and McCarthyism and the expulsion of the CP-led unions from CIA, from the from the CIO, there was really a rupture, right? The left had really been based in the trade unions in the United States historically, but at that time there was a rupture, right? Then during the 60s, and as you talk about, kind of with the growth of the new left, the uh, the new left, the, uh, the revival of the left wing, the new left, it's in the universities, mm -hmm. right? The students for a democratic society, right? You know, in terms of the various groups there. And so, you know, after, right, the, you know, the SDS implodes, right, uh, you know, there are, ver as you talk, as you kind of mentioned, you know, there are various groups that then decide, hey, you know, if we really want to make change in society, we've got to go back into, in terms of, in the trade unions, in, you know, which they started in, in the 1970s, and there were all, you know, different types of groups, right, you know, I mean, uh, you know, the Socialist Workers Party, the the Trotskyists didn't make the turn to industry until like 1978. But for instance, like the International Socialists uh, went in, you know, they're, uh, you know, uh, uh, a Trotskyist organization, uh, maybe not, you know, orthodox like the SWP was, but they're going in in the early 1970s. The Maoists are going in mm -hmm. at the time, right? And, and as you point out, there's a, there's a proliferation of different kinds of vanguard parties. But there had really been this rupture, so it's in a in a sense they have to, you know, start organizing from scratch, right? Because there had been a rupture for about you know twenty years, right? There had been still individual leftists from the old left, right? The Communist Party USA, you know, the Socialist Workers Party, etc., still active in the trade unions, uh, you know, in you know, in the 50s, in the 60s, but they were active as individuals or in broader progressive reform trade union groups. So there had been that real rupture in, in the left, which kind of forced the, uh, you know, the new left once they went into the trade unions in the, in the 1970s to try to figure things out on their own because there weren't the, the organized, you know, successful organizers from the past, the 30s and 40s, there weren't many of them still left in in the unions at that time. Yeah, it seems to be one of the ironies I get from a lot of this work, particularly when you look at the entire scope. And I know we started talking about the TUL because it's under underheard about. Yes. But um, that there is like the, the, the great irony is that the CIO really built up a lot of the capacity that enables like um, the the social compact in the 50s and early yeah. 60s to exist yeah. and yet they're not able to benefit from it at all because they're perched so yeah. um how much i mean we talk about this with the new left but how damaging was that purge you think to labor history like uh, oh i mean i i think i i i think that rupture was crucial in terms of that gap of 20 years right and you know, in terms of uh, really the merger in the AFL-CIO, there was kind of no real opposition in terms of kind of business unionism. Now, you know, in terms of starting in the late 1960s, right, 67, 68, right, the United Auto Workers becomes critical of the AFL-CIO because it's backing the Vietnam War and the UAW is against the Vietnam War. So they actually leave the AFL-CIO and, you know, the Teamsters had been expelled in 1957, mm -hmm. basically for, you know, cor for corruption, right? You're probably aware of that. Las Vegas, the casinos mm -hmm. of Las Vegas was built on Teamsters pension money, right? That was mm -hmm. loaned to the mob. So they had been expelled in 1957. So in, in 1968, the United Auto Workers forms with the Teamsters Union, the Alliance for Labor Action, 
And there's a couple of other small, smaller unions in there, the chemical workers union, et cetera. And they're kind of, you know, a broadly more like, um, you know, a, a reform group calling for changes in society. I mean, broadly, they, you know, their politics would probably be considered social democratic. And so, you know, they try to start organizing the unorganized. And you said you were from Georgia, right? I am. And so they're... Um, uh, I don't know where you're from in, in, in Georgia, but in terms of they launched a major organizing campaign in Atlanta mm -hmm. in, in the late 60s, early 70s, the Alliance for Labor Action. And they spent a lot of money there and they only organized about 10,000 workers. Right. But, you know, the South. Right. I mean, because of the Communist Party being expelled from the CIO. Right. There was probably no no more, you know, the AFL-CIO then wasn't really committed to trying to organize the South. Right. And probably if the communists were still involved, they would have tried to organize the South. And so just think about organizing the South, how the civil rights movement might have unfolded differently if there was, you know, stronger support in terms of the trade union movement. So I think this rupture was absolutely crucial in affecting the development of labor unions in the United States, that there wasn't really a force to the left that was challenging the business unionism. And, you know, as I said, the, the United Auto Workers and the Teamsters formed this Alliance for Labor Action. It only lasted for about four years. And, you know, they they had some very progressive a, a agenda, but there were only maybe about three and a half million members in that, you know, compared to, uh, um, you know, the 13, 14 million in the AFL-CIO. And they just didn't have the same resources as the afl CIO did so. So, um, do you think that's part of why, for example, today, if you look at the the penetration of unionization, it's mostly in, I mean, almost guild unions. <laughs> I mean, like I say this as a teacher, I don't want to accuse te teachers' yeah. unions of being guild unions, but um, uh, it is interesting to me that like the 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 unions that are still around that still have some power are unions that would definitely be close to the craft unions because not just are we skilled, but you like, you legally can't scab on us. Mm. Like, um, and I, I've thought about that a lot. It, it, yeah. it seems to be that this was crucial, that shift in the, in the fifties and sixties. Um, and I, do you think that's a large part of why it's been harder to get, uh, new union membership in and, and even today where we've seen a revival of of um a a, a, a I, I should be very careful because some of this is oversold but yeah. um a revival of of unionization it has not been in generally in already existing unions that are pretty well established mm -hmm. um yeah, so I mean, I think one thing in terms of you know uh, the craft union advantage, you know, certainly after the expulsion of this of the CP led unions, you know, they basically control the labor market, right? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of through apprenticeship programs, and so you know they can keep wages high. You know, their their membership is fairly small when when compared to the, the to the mass production unions, and so you know. Uh, Certainly, uh, you know, the peak of union density in the United States overall was approximately 1955 at the time of the AFL-CIO merger, 35% or so. And, you know, it was going down, it's been going down since then. It probably wasn't noticed until the 1970s, probably the late 1970s, because in terms of manufacturing, in manufacturing, industries were still doing fairly well. And the peak of manufacturing was in 1979, manufacturing employment in, in this in this country. And so, you know, in terms of United Steelworker membership, United Auto Worker membership, United Rubber Worker membership, they were still doing well through the late 1970s. But then, you know, the period of deindustrialization really starting in 1981, 82 with the closing of steel plants, auto factories, really, uh, you know, affected 
the industrial unions a lot more than in terms of the craft unions. And so in some sense, the industrial unions had to go out and reinvent themselves. And so they started organizing then after that, the industrial unions, because manufacturing employment was starting to go down, they started organizing other jurisdictions that aren't related to manufacturing. So, you know, there was in some sense a transformation from industrial unionism to general unionism, mm -hmm. right? For instance, right, the United Auto Workers was, you know, starting in the 1990s, was starting to organize graduate research and teaching assistants at universities, right? They were organizing, you know, clerical workers at Blue Cross Blue Shield, mm -hmm. right? They were organizing legal aid lawyers in New York City. They even organized in the early 2000s uh, 400 undergraduate resident assistants at the University of Massachusetts. And so it wasn't just the, the United Auto Workers, but some of these other industrial unions were expanding their jurisdictions to organize in sectors to try to still remain viable because manufacturing, uh, manufacturing employment was, was starting to decline. Um, to kind of take it back to TUL a, a yeah. bit, even though we've gone all the way, we've now like basically sure. covered like the 20th century. Sure. Um, uh, what I, what I, what I think is interesting about this, uh, is that the T, the TUL does seem to show a fluidity of tactics that, um, perhaps we should revisit a little bit because it does not, it seems like. Um, any any kind of principle made into uh, any kind of tactic made into a principle might right. be a problem in right. a labor market that is so fluid. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. I think like that's a, on that? Yeah, I think that's a good point that you said, and I think that I think uh, you know principles are important, and that's that's what should guide an organization. But there should be a flexibility in tactics, and so you shouldn't just be wedded to a certain set of tactics if. If you see that as you as you talk about the labor market changes and you need to adopt your tactics, I think you should adopt the tactics. You shouldn't necessarily you shouldn't adopt, you know, you shouldn't change your principles, but certainly you should be flexible in terms of, of the tactics. But I think one thing that's important in terms of organizing when you're organizing, uh, the way you organize is important to how the union is going to look afterwards. For instance, if you're organizing and you're at, and you value rank and file organizers and you value participation and you value democratic decision making, you know, assuming that you obtain employer recognition, I think your union is going to, is likely to be much healthier and, and likely to be a more democratic participatory shop floor oriented union rather than if you're organizing just from in a sense the top down and all you're asking is the employees to do is to sign a union authorization card and vote for the union in the election and you don't expect them to become actively involved in the union organizing drive then why are they going to necessarily become active in the local union once once it's recognized during union organizing employees learn a lot of important skills right and so uh you know they need to feel a part of the union and that their views are valued and they can make a lot of important contributions and this is going to lead to a much healthier union once the union obtains employer recognition, whether it's through secret ballot elections, you know, whether it's through voluntary recognition, right, through a card check election, et cetera, right? So I think in terms of how you organize workers is going to have uh, a great effect in terms of what the union looks like. So the goal shouldn't be, well, let's just organize workers any way that we can and then hope that the local unions are effective. I think that in terms of organizing from the beginning, it's, uh, you know, the employees themselves have to be involved. There have to be a lot of rank and file organizers and, you know, there has to be a democratic structure set up and to encourage participation among the employees. Hmm. Um, 
Uh, one thing I find interesting, and I, and I don't know that it's totally avoidable, but I always think about uh, Pareto's study of unions in the 19, I think, 20s, proto-fascist stuff. Yeah. But um, about how much uh, resentment there often is amongst the rank and file at union bureaucratization. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, my, my own, my father was a mechanic and, mm-hmm. uh, had very little good to say about unions because that, but he's also from the South. So, you know. okay. um, uh, I'm in a teacher's union and there are times when there are certain, uh, where the, uh, the, the union staff members, uh, particip- um, the union staff is almost as large as as at least union representation in some places almost as large as union membership uh-huh. um uh and it's i you know uh, as a union rep it's hard to uh motivate people to join that i mean other than maybe cheap insurance yeah. Yeah. um yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that point's taken with me um do how much do you think uh, I guess the question becomes to me, like, how much of this is a, an effect of uh, overcomplication over time, and how much of it is this is this, you know, the purging of this mm-hmm. of this in the fifties? Like, I go back and forth. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I mean, certainly, I, uh, uh, you know, there has to be some level of union bureaucratization, mm-hmm. of course, when you're. Uh, uh, you know, after you've organized the union, right? You can't vote on, for instance, well, how many pencils should the union office purchase, right, et cetera, right? Certainly minor decisions have to be made by union officials, but you you raise a good point. And certainly a lot of what motivated Communist Party organizers <laughs> was ideology, mm-hmm. right? And that they really wanted to, to do well by the workers, right? And I mean, not not just, uh, you know, other leftists too who, who got involved, whether they're Trotskyists, Maoists, right? In terms of other types of socialists. And I mean, um, you know, I think one of the, and you're probably aware of this, I mean, one of the saddest things I think is, is the, the recent corruption in, in the United Auto Workers mm. Union, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, certainly levels of corruption uh, in unions are higher in the United States than in any other industrial or post-industrial country in the world. And that's probably because of there is more left-wing influence in terms of these other countries. And that business unionism has come to dominate American unions. So then union officials say, okay, well, why not? Why can't I spend money on villas or on golf clubs or on, you know, uh, spousal support payments, et cetera? And, you know, um, certainly if you look at also corruption in terms of unions historically, in terms of the Communist Party led CIO unions, there was virtually no corruption, mm-hmm. right, in terms of, the, uh, of that. So, um, but, you know, I can understand that uh, employees don't want to join unions if, if they feel that the union leadership or, you know, the union bureaucracy is a layer out for themselves rather than the membership and, you know, views themselves as kind of a privileged strata. For instance, you may or may not be aware of this, but right, the United Electrical Workers Union, mm-hmm. which though is a progressive union, was a Communist Party-led union. The international president can make no more than the highest paid worker on the shop floor, Mm -hmm. right? So that, so if the international president and the other union officials want to raise, then they better get raises for the union members, right? And, but, you know, that's certainly not the case in terms of, of other unions, but I think that that's an indication that, uh, you know, coming out of its its left-wing tradition and still a pro- progressive trade union, that that the UE is still a union that fights for its members, right? And so, I mean, you know, I understand what you're saying. And I've heard that that same kind of criticism from other workers, you know, when 
they've talked to me about uh, about unionization. Yeah, I think I think one of the things I learned from this period, be it uh, TUL or, or the IWW, is that you really need um, buy-in and participation, and uh, the the reps need to matter. That probably more than the staff. That yeah, you know, like, like not 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 that I don't want to like. Heck, I've actually helped. <laughs> one of the funniest things is now sometimes you have to help union staffers unionize against the union, which is weird, but it happens. Yeah. Um, uh, so I don't want to sound like I'm against union staffers at all. Um, but it's, it is interesting. You, one of the, one of the tells for me, I think is uh, the predominance of non oppositional negotiations um, and contracts, which is like standard now, particularly in, in a lot mm -hmm. of unions. Which is when I learned that, and I didn't learn it till recently, actually. Um, and I was like, okay, if we were all, if the, if the membership of the union was more that was more involved, and we had larger penetration into uh, the workplace, and you know, in Utah where I currently live, we did, like mm -hmm. I've been told our union is large for the West, which which mm -hmm. was somewhat disheartening to me when I was like, well, there's, there's 90 people on staff and we have 12 of them, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> like, uh -huh. um, uh, and we're a large union. What are the other uh -huh. States like? Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, so, so those things, when I read about this time period though, I, there's a lot of principles I, I deduce from that. And that is one, well, like ideology does matter. Um, yeah. Um, participation matters even more, mm -hmm. um, and being flexible because that, that is one thing you really see in the, in, and I mean, from like 1900 to, to the heroic period of CAO is like the yep. super flexibility. I mean, unions weren't even totally legal when most of these things started. So mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's certainly interesting to think about. Um, are there other, any other key takeaways we can take away? take away from this period um from the the 30s do you think any other key lessons yeah i mean i think i think we've uh covered uh you know a, a lot of ground here and i can't think of anything else to say that hasn't been said or that you haven't asked in terms of that that you haven't touched on but i mean maybe you know an important thing you know just going back in terms of to talk about that rupture, you know, with the Communist Party led unions being expelled, you know, uh, you know, a period of about 20 years where there really wasn't that old left influence in the unions really was decisive in terms of shape it shaping the union. So, so if my uh, listeners wanted to go and study this more on their own, where would you suggest they start? Yeah, I mean, there, you know, there, uh, you know, there's a lot of good labor history books out there that that they could read. I mean, um, uh, you know, if they have certain, you know, in terms of uh, certain interests in certain areas, I mean, you could even share with your listeners my email address, and if they emailed me that they're interested specifically in this or that, maybe I could you know, recommend certain, certain books, certain articles, et cetera. Okay. But. I would definitely link to your faculty page uh, um, in the show notes. And I'd like to thank you for your time. I learned a lot from, for, from uh, your research. Um, uh, like I said, I barely knew the TUL existed until yeah. <laughs> research. So yeah. um, thank you for that. Um, uh, uh, have a great evening and okay. and we'll end here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Come on. Where are we at?